Welcome everybody to today's webinar on helping local cavity nesters in Florida and specifically here in Pinellas County. We are gonna go ahead and get started. It's 1215, we will likely have people jumping on as we go, which is fine and welcome. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lara Milligan. I am the natural resources agent. I work for UF IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County. I would be remiss if I did not give my colleague and counterpart in Polk County credit for some of the slides uh, in this presentation. We have co-presented this presentation. I have made some slight modifications, so it was a joint effort. So she deserves just as much credit. So her name is Shannon Carnavale, and she is the natural resources and conservation agent in Polk County. So real quick, um, it looks like Zoom is constantly updating settings and things. So you guys are all muted. Your videos are off. You should not be able to turn either of them on. The video feature is new. Um, but please, we just ask, even if you are able to somehow start your video, uh, to not do that, just to minimize distractions for everybody else. If you're interested to see who is joining you today, you can click on the participants list on your screen. Feel free to use the chat feature throughout today's presentation. It is just me, so if you have questions, I encourage you to hold them until the very end when I can focus on the chat. Um, but if you're one that might forget your question, feel free to type it in and I'll do my best to scroll back and then you can always retype it again if I somehow miss it. You might see a share screen feature that is disabled for you guys as well, so don't worry about that. Feel free if you have the reactions icon, if you wanna be engaged in that way and let me know what you're thinking along the way. Um, you're welcome to use that to stay engaged as well. Also on the top of your screen, there should be a view options drop down menu. I believe the default is side by side mode and that should enable you to see the presentation as well as my talking head um, kind of parallel to one another. And there's a little bar and you can slide that back and forth and you could either make me really small and the presentation really big or to whatever your desire is. And that does not alter what other people are seeing. That is just for you on your screen. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, through Pinellas County Extension. So if you've not been there, we have a wealth of on-demand webinars on a variety of natural resource topics. So we encourage you to check that out if you have not been there before and subscribe so you can stay up to date when we add new videos. So for today's presentation, we are gonna touch briefly on just general backyard bird habitat, because while we're focusing on cavity nesters, the information in that section is relevant to all birds. Then we will hone in on defining cavity nesters. We're gonna feature a couple common cavity nesters um, the list is quite long, which you'll see, so I just picked some that are more common in this area. And then, of course, ways that you can help to support our cavity nesters. I do plan to wrap this up by one o'clock, so I'll do my best to keep us on time so we can keep it as a lunch and learn <laughs> webinar. So jumping right in to habitat, how birds choose habitat, this really goes for any wildlife species. This might kind of be like standard information for some of you, but they need right food, water, shelter, and space. And every species is gonna have different requirements. So it's, if you're looking to attract a particular species, knowing exactly what it is that they want or need is really important. So we're gonna kind of focus in on each of these a little bit more, just to give you guys some things to think about that maybe you haven't thought about before. So right, obviously if we're trying to support and help cavity nesters, providing these resources for them is important. So in terms of food, we always stress planting native vegetation. This is what these species have grown up and adapted um, to live with and feed on over time. Exotic species can be also beneficial in terms of a food source, but again, the birds have grown up with native vegetation for a lot longer. So we stress that. And then you also have to be okay, like if you plant pretty berries, they might get eaten and we need to just be okay with that. Um, in terms of vegetation, if you wanna really be supporting a wide variety of birds in your yard, we stress to think about 
looking at when the plants flower and or fruit and try and pick plants that will do that year round. So there's something in fruit or in flower all throughout the year. So there's a variety of food resources available. And then there's something that we call edge habitat, which is kind of what you might think about, just the edge of where habitat exists. Edge habitat is critical. There's tons of research on edge, ha edge habitat. And that's because where kind of one habitat ends and another one starts, there's a higher amount of diversity in that area, right? Because we're taking one ecosystem and meeting it together with another. And so that just provides a, a wider variety of food and other, as well as shelter, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we'll talk a little bit more about edge when we get to vegetation. Leaving snags, which are just standing dead trees, as well as woody de um, debris, any type of down branches or um, debris that you have in your yard, you can kind of pile together. And those, you might be like, well, how is that food? <laughs> um, and that's because they're going to be broken down by decomposers, a lot of which are insects, a lot of which are a major food source for a wide variety of birds. Now, when it comes to what we would call like gardening for birds, there's a number of species that you could consider. This is literally just a very short list to kind of get you thinking some of the more common ones that we see. Any holly tree is a pretty big favorite of our birds. And it's important to keep in mind with holly trees, there's the male and the females are separate trees. So the female trees are gonna be the ones that produce the berries. So just keep that in mind and you need both in order for the berries to occur. American beautyberry, which is featured on the top of the screen is a beautiful, beautiful plant appropriately named and a big favorite. I know here I'm stationed at Brooker Creek Preserve up in Tarpon Springs and the catbirds go crazy <laughs> for this berry. Mulberry is another big one. I know a lot of people who have mulberries are right now saying like, my mulberry tree is getting like going insane with fruit right now. So that is a huge plus. Maybe if you want the fruits, maybe not as much, but the birds will go crazy for those as well. Chickasaw plum, not only good for its fruit, but really good structure and shelter for birds. And same with a magnolia tree, southern magnolia, featured on the bottom here. That is one tree that I get to see right outside my window and the birds love, love the magnolia tree, not only for its fruit, but again, for its shelter that it provides. So another thing to consider highly consider <laughs> providing is water, um, especially when we get into the dry season. So outside of May through October, like right now, <laughs> there might not be as much water available because we're not getting as much rain. So if we are providing a consistent source of water, that's going to be attractive to birds as well as other species. So a bird bath is a pretty um, kind of standard and relatively easy option for providing water there is a lot to consider with bird baths in terms of maintenance and kind of keeping that water fresh, making sure it's not stagnant and breeding mosquitoes. Um, you could also go a little bit further and create a pond in your yard that in itself, again, requires maintenance to make sure the water is clean. And, and really any water feature that you provide is going to be beneficial for birds. Now, when it comes to shelter, one thing that we like to stress is something called islands of vegetation. And that's pretty much what you might be envisioning in your brain. Um, but by creating these kind of little pockets of vegetation throughout your yard, it not only increases that edge habitat, um, but it creates like its own little shelter space for these birds. Instead of it being this vast expanse, um, it just gives them little pockets to kind of hide in and be able to look out into the yard. Within the islands or really wherever you're planting your vegetation, we always stress diversity, not only in the types of plants that you are planting, but in the structure that they provide. So that means like the height of the plants and just the overall structure. So if we think about like a magnolia tree, right? Massive big tree, it's gonna grow up really tall compared to a beauty berry that might be, you know, it's gonna be lower to the ground and kind of provide shelter for the species that prefer to occupy a lower space. So just giving a variety of options will benefit a wider um, diversity of bird species. 
And then again, large woody debris or snags, in addition to being a potential food source for our cavity nesters, um, they might take advantage of those standing dead trees and excavate a cavity, which can then benefit a wide variety of species, which we are gonna learn about in just a second. As for space, this is one that is more of like a limiting factor, right? We have our yard and that's really it. We can't do, we can't go planting stuff in our neighbor's yard in most cases. Um, so one thing that we like to stress is while some smaller birds might be fine with what you are providing right in your yard, a larger bird like a hawk would be looking at kind of like a larger scale of your overall neighborhood. So if you can, if you have neighbors that you talk to on the regular, um, you can consider involving them be like, hey, I'm gonna build like bird habitat back here. You know, would you wanna do it too? If you don't, you know, if you have distant neighbors, that is fine. Um, and I'm gonna show in a couple slides why, it, whether it's just you, your next door neighbor or a distant neighbor, why it's all important to provide habitat. If you happen to be next to a park, whether it's a county or a city park, you could reach out to the staff there and think about inquiring if they would wanna partner on a larger effort. A lot of cities are starting to really get involved with like wildlife corridor projects and just wanting to expand the natural resources that we have and can provide for our local wildlife species. So this is just one snippet of research that highlights the value and importance of smaller parcels of land. Often when we think about um, conservation, right, we're focusing on these large tracts of land. And it's, it's not to say that smaller tracts of land are not important. And so there's been a lot more research as we've developed more and uh, our natural areas are more and more fragmented to show that even what you can do right in your own yard is valuable and beneficial. It might not be as beneficial as, you know, a hundred acre plus plot of land, but it's still beneficial. So this graph on the left, it's just categorizing different types of birds from omnivores, nectivores, insectivores, frugivores, and you can see the small patches of land. So that's looking at less than two and a half acres, which as far as I'm aware in Pinellas County is most um, residential areas. Um, you can still see that they are providing um, beneficial habitat for a large number of species. The large patch is kind of the striped one and then in the middle is the medium size. So don't be discouraged. <laughs> What you do in your own yard can have a positive impact. Now, today we're going to be just talking about cavity nesters, and that's like one category of many types of birds, and it's just one way that we can categorize birds. So this shows all different nesting strategies that you can find among our bird species throughout the world. <laughs> so, right, we have penguins that they just like our anti no nest needed. And then we have, you know, floating nests on top of vegetation. We have birds that actually create burrows. And then just within a tree, there's all different cups, there's platform nesters. So you can see from this image, it varies considerably. And there's all different things that we can do to support different birds nesting strategies. But again, we're just going to focus in on cavity nesters today. So simply put, if it's not self-explanatory in the name itself, cavity nesters roughly defined as birds that build nests, lay eggs, and raise young inside sheltered cavities. And we'll see as we continue on that those cavities can be a wide variety of things. So when it comes to cavity nesters, we like to categorize, break it into two categories. So there's primary cavity nesters, and those are birds that excavate their own cavities or holes in the trees. Then there's secondary cavity nesters, and those would be the birds that take advantage of the holes excavated by primary cavity nesters, or they're taking advantage of natural, naturally formed cavities. Like if you think of um, red maples are often known for kind of creating their own cavities. They're just, it's a very, delicate wood, I guess I'll say. Um, 
and they're just prone to forming their own cavities. So some birds will just take advantage of that. And you can see on the image on the right, this was taken right here at Brooker Creek Preserve. On the top, this is a pileated woodpecker. It's a male. They have um, kind of this red patch. We call it a red mustache. That is not the official term. <laughs> um, the females would lack this red stripe right here. And he is excavating this cavity. You can actually see he's throwing out little wood chips. And we got to watch this. It was like, honestly, the coolest thing <laughs> I've ever seen. And then shortly after, you know, they did their business, they were gone. And then it got occupied by a screech owl. So primary cavity nester, secondary cavity nester. And so there are lots of cavity nesters in Florida. And this kind of breaks up the primary and secondary, primary being most of our woodpecker species, as well as nuthatches and the Carolina chickadee. And then secondary includes, again, a wide variety. Um, our owls, believe it or not, black and turkey vultures are classified as cavity nesters. They um, nest in cavities on the ground. And then a variety of songbirds from our Carolina wren, our eastern bluebird, the great crested flycatcher. Then we have some, um, the hooded merganser and wood duck. So it, I think for a lot of people, they don't realize like how many species of birds actually take advantage of cavities for nesting. So that's a kind of big picture for you. Now, when it comes to providing artificial nest boxes, it's important to mention that not all of those species I just showed you will occupy or take advantage of a nest box. So vultures, for example, not gonna use an artificial nest box. And woodpeckers in general, while there are tons of nest plans, which is what you see on the screen below, because they can create their own cavities, they just tend to not take advantage of nest boxes as much as some of the other species. Another thing that is critical to point out, and I'll stress this again later, is there is not a one size fits all when it comes to nest boxes. Uh, that's one of the reasons we don't really ever say like, hey, just go to your local you know, home goods store and buy you know, one of the nest boxes there. Because if you're trying to attract a particular species, it's really critical that we get the dimensions of the box correct. And you can see here, so this goes everywhere from floor size to the size of the entrance hole to um, the number of feet above ground where you would mount the box. And you can see it varies significantly on all aspects <laughs> from the diameter of the hole to the um, interior size of the floor, box height, everything. So that's just important to keep in mind. So now we're going to dive into learning about some of our local species that we have here. These are, again, some of the more common cavity nesting species that we have here, which is why we're gonna focus on them, because hopefully you'll go outside and be able to see some of these. Now, when it comes to woodpeckers, again, primary cavity nesters, we have all of these species here in Florida, the downy woodpecker, the hairy woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker, the red-bellied woodpecker, the red-cockaded woodpecker, the red-headed woodpecker, and then the northern flicker, even though it doesn't have woodpecker in its name, it is also a woodpecker. Um, I did not include the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is also a type of woodpecker, um, just because they don't, they don't nest here in Florida. So looking at these two species, we're going to start off with the downy woodpecker. I'm going to play their call for you because you might not always see them, but perhaps you've heard them and not known that this is the call of the downy woodpecker. So it's a pretty distinct call once you learn it. Um, and it is really fun. If you're not into birding yet, it is really fun to start by learning a few calls. And then you can be like, oh, I hear a, like you might not always see it, but you can just ID by sound and by call. So depending where you are um, and kind of what habitat is around you, they can be anywhere from uncommon to fairly common, like here in the preserve. Obviously we have lots of natural land. They're fairly common here, but they are year round residents in Florida. 
nesting season is early spring, so we're just getting there. Um, and I think a lot of people think woodpeckers are solely feeding on insects, but that's not the case. Most of them have a pretty varied diet anywhere from the beetle larvae, right, that we would think as we watch them kind of peck into the wood and things like ants and caterpillars, but they'll also eat berries, acorns, and a variety of different seeds. We actually got to witness a pileated woodpecker, the really large one, feeding on some smilax or green buyer, green briar berries the other day. And that was the first time I've seen that. So it was, it was really, really cool. And the downy woodpecker is the smallest woodpecker in North America. So these pictures here are both the downy woodpecker. The males have this little red spot on their head. The females would lack that spot. In terms of their nesting cavities, they are kind of particular <laughs> in their nesting cavities in terms of natural nest cavities. So both the males and the females will create the hole, but they tend to have a preference for A, deciduous trees, B, on a limb off of a dead or dying tree, um, and C, making their cavity on the underside of that limb. So I actually this got to see this right um, Outside where I live, there was a sycamore tree, which is deciduous, um, and it was the hole was right on the underside of a twig. There is a preference for about seven inches in diameter. I'd say mine, ours is probably a little bit smaller than that, but otherwise it was right on <laughs> with the description here. In general, about 12 to 30 feet above ground is where their nest cavities are gonna be located. And again, in terms of a nest box, they're, occasional use of it, I would say, is at best. And they can use them both for breeding and or roosting, but they're gonna have more preference for ones that they create themselves. Now, moving on to the red-bellied woodpecker. I'm gonna again play their call and I'm gonna grab a quick sip of water while you're listening for this. This is one I'm, I can pretty much guarantee all of you listening have heard. So maybe you've heard that, maybe not, but now you'll kind of hopefully be tuned into it. These are a much more common woodpecker compared to the downy woodpecker. Again, they are also year-round residents, nesting season early spring. You'll notice that's a common trend. And again, they feed on insects as well as plant material. And one of their favorite trees, I included this picture intentionally, is the cabbage palm. The wood tends to be a little bit easier for them to excavate, so you'll often find them on cabbage palm, but that is not like exclusive, the only tree that they will use. So for the red-bellied woodpecker, the males not only excavate one cavity, but they will excavate multiple cavities, and then the females get to choose which one that they like best. <laughs> so that sounds like a very lovely setup, if I say so myself. They will do this either in, again in a dead limb, similar to the downy woodpecker or a dead tree. Now in terms of height above the ground, I've seen a wide variety of numbers for the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, generally, I'd say less than 40 to 50 feet above the ground, but I think the highest I saw documented was like 120 feet off the ground, so it can vary. The other unique thing, you would think if you're going to spend all that time excavating a cavity, you would just reuse the same one year after year, but they don't. <laughs> it can happen from time to time, but they tend to choose the same tree if it's still standing, and they will just excavate a new hole beneath the hole that they excavated the previous year. So kudos to them. The males do a lot of work <laughs> in that sense. Um, again, they may use a natural form cavity, or they are also known for using abandoned holes of other woodpeckers, um, but they can excavate their own, and then occasional use of nest boxes. Now, real quick, I do want to point this out, and perhaps some of you were like, that's not a red-bellied woodpecker, because this is a very common error that we hear people say. 
So the red-bellied woodpecker has a red head and is often misnamed or misidentified as a red-headed woodpecker, which is over here on the right. So a red-headed woodpecker, they're much more rare. We really don't have them here in Pinellas County. Um, we just don't have the habitat for them anymore. But you can see they're, they have a much more solid coloration, the black and then just a white patch and a very solid red head. So once you see them, you're like, oh, that makes sense that they're called a red-headed woodpecker. The red-bellied woodpecker, you can kind of see a little wash of red on their bellies. So that's where they get their name. Um, and I forgot one more thing I wanted to mention. So you might notice between, on this picture here, the red coloration, you can see it's just on the back of the head. There's a little bit above the bill as well, but <clears throat> there's kind of this gap here. So this indicates that this is a female. The males, the red goes all the way over the top of the head, which you can really see well right here. So that's how you would differentiate male from female on the red-bellied woodpecker. Now, there's lots of species in Florida, both plants and animals that can be confused with one another, so much so that we created a field guide to help people differentiate between commonly confused species. So this is available through the UF IFAS bookstore. I don't benefit from this. My co-author does not benefit directly from this. The proceeds go directly into our program fund. So if you're interested, you can check it out at the UF IFAS bookstore, or we also have some available for sale at the nature store up at Burker Creek Preserve. So that was just a quick plug for that. <laughs> okay, now on to like maybe slightly biased, the world's cutest bird is the Carolina chickadee. I'm gonna play its call. So again, it's a pretty distinct call. They have a variety of calls, um, but that is kind of one of their signature ones. Again, depending on where you live, they can be anywhere from uncommon to fairly common, another year round resident, um, but only in North and Central Florida. So if you're tuning in from South Florida, you're not as likely to see the Carolina chickadee. Despite being uh, a more common cavity nester, overall their populations are in decline which is another reason I chose to include this one in the presentation, because you can create a nest box to help support them if you know you have them in your area. Again, nesting season, early spring, they too have a varied diet. I have seen them go to town on some caterpillars, <laughs> those poor things, they get whipped all over the place. Um, moths, beetles, aphids, if you are a hater of aphids eating your plants, then you'll want to support these Carolina chickadees. They're also huge fans of spiders and occasionally will eat seeds and berries as well. So for the Carolina chickadee, both sexes again are involved in the excavation of the nest cavity. So they are again considered primary cavity nesters in order to take advantage of this because they are not woodpeckers. They're not designed to fully really excavate the cavities like woodpeckers are they are gonna really choose partially rotten wood that's a lot softer already for them to excavate. And they nest significantly lower than most other bird species, so about five to six feet above ground. And while both excavate the nest, um, or the cavity, I should say, the females will construct the nest inside and they use a wide variety of materials, including moss. They'll even take um, thin strips of bark and a variety of grasses to create that. Again, they may use a natural cavity that has occurred in a tree or abandoned holes of our primary cavity, uh, other primary cavity nesters like woodpeckers, um, but they do have the ability to excavate their own. And the good news is they do like to use nest boxes. I think that's probably because they're really not designed the best like woodpeckers to excavate cavities. So if they're like, oh, there's a hole that suits me perfectly, I'm gonna use it. That's like totally anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic statement. Um, but there we go, I said it. <laughs> so there's a number of nest box plans out there, variety of sites. They should hopefully be pretty similar if you're looking like species specific. This is just one example of one. So they give you all the information that you need for 
how big each piece should be, where everything should be attached. Um, and more than that, like it's not like just get an S box or just build an S box and put it wherever you want. There's a lot to consider as to what you affix it to, how high off the ground. Um, if you wanna install more than one, how far apart they should be. So all of this information is provided. I'm gonna mention some resources at the end. This is from Cornell's Nest Watch, this information here. So um, just, just things to keep in mind. I'm gonna go through a longer list of things that you have to consider with nest boxes. So the last species we will wrap up with is the Eastern Screech Owl. And I'm gonna play its call. So no, that was not a horse. <laughs> so if you've ever heard that and been like, I think somebody has a horse around me, um, it very well might be an Eastern Screech Owl. They can be anywhere from rare to fairly common residents. I would say in Pinellas County, despite us being very urban, they have adapted very well to um, like suburban and urban areas. And so I'd say they're pretty common here just based on input or questions that I received from clients. Um, an interest in things like this webinar and the cavity nest workshop that we're going to have coming up, which I'll mention in a minute. They are another species, though, overall that is in decline. So again, another reason I included them. And they are the smallest owl species that we have here. They only get like six to nine inches tall. They're super, super cute. Again, that might be biased, but they are. And they're very well camouflaged. You can see in this picture on the right which is a great adaptation that they have. So nesting season, anywhere from early spring um, to late spring. And their diet is pretty varied, but you can see anywhere from grasshoppers, the elite lizards, the elite frogs and snakes, crayfish, worms, even other small songbirds. So quite variable there. So thinking back to like creating the habitat for bird species, right? Crayfish need a water source. Frogs need a water source in order to basically exist. So if we want to be supporting screech owls, providing that water source is critical. So screech owls do not have the ability to excavate their own cavities. So they are really going to rely on the primary cavity nesters or naturally formed cavities. So let's think back to that image I showed you with the pileated woodpecker excavating the cavity that got taken over by the screech owl. The other good news for them too is they love to use nest boxes. So um, another reason that we're including them here and doing a workshop, not this Saturday, but next. Occasionally they have been documented to use um, wood piles, even taking up resident in old mailboxes or crates that have been left out. So they're pretty adaptable for a small owl species, especially, especially in urban areas. Now, when it comes to their nest box in particular, it's really best to attach it to a kind of lone standing pole, but you can also attach it to a live tree. Um, the live tree just increases the likelihood of predators potentially invading the nest box. Excuse me, height anywhere from 10 to 30 feet off the ground. If you do want to provide more than one nest box in your yard, the spacing recommendation is 100 feet. And while you can face the nest box in any direction, one thing that they suggest is to put it somewhere nearby other smaller branches so that the young can practice um, when they're starting to fledge, they can get out of the nest box and kind of stretch their wings and do their business instead of just like hopping out of the nest box and having nowhere to go. Okay. So there's a, a lot to consider. I'm gonna go through a pretty lengthy list here of things to consider when it comes to nest boxes. And these are just important things to keep in mind if you're gonna go down the route of building one or purchasing one, some things to look for and think about. So attaching it, I've kind of alluded to a lot of these, but how high you're gonna attach it will depend on what species, um, where on the tree, what direction, um, is it gonna be on a pole? Is it gonna be on a, um, dead tree, a live tree, what direction is it going to face? In terms of cleaning the nest boxes, 
that's going to vary species to species. Some prefer after they're done doing their business nesting um, and the young have fledged and they're gone. <clears throat> Cleaning out what is in there, some species like that. Some species will don't care. You leave it in there and they'll just come back and nest in the same um, box again. So you just have to, when you do your research on which nest plan you're going to do, that information should be provided. Drainage is critical, especially here in Florida. It's raining outside right now. Um, so it's really important to include slits or holes in the bottom of the nest box to allow any water that gets in to have a place to escape. Another way that you can avoid um, potential impacts from water is to inset the base from the sides so that if water drips down the side and kind of seeps up and under, it won't get inside the nest box. Galvanized screws and nails are recommended. It's, they're just a little bit more sustainable and durable for our crazy weather here in Florida. A lot of people do like to paint their nest box because it's a fun activity and you, know, you can make it look pretty, but really we're trying to mimic what is out in nature. And so natural wood is best. Even if you have like, if you're able to let the wood weather a little bit, that's even better. If you wanted to get creative and maybe try and mimic like make it more camouflaged, I would say that's best. There are risks with the toxins from paint though, potentially harming the birds. So really unpainted is best. Now, often when you purchase kind of a pre-made nest box from a store, often they will include a little perch and that is really not needed. If anything, that just assists with predators accessing the nest box. So we encourage no perches. Typically you will see on nest boxes that the roof will overhang the front and that is intentional. Again, it prevents water from kind of going over the edge and then going directly into the box and or into the cavity itself. I've already mentioned this, one size does not fit all. Um, so you just gotta do your research depending on which species you want to attract. Ventilation is another critical thing to consider, especially here in Florida. We like to include slits or holes at the top, right? Hot air rises. And so if you have everything very tightly sealed um, and the hot air has nowhere to escape, that is not a good setup. We don't wanna create a sauna for these birds. So having somewhere for that air to escape is great. Untreated wood is typically what is recommended. There is no, from what I have been able to conclude, there's no research that shows that treated wood is detrimental to birds, um, but we kind of err on the side of caution with that. And so um, we just usually stress untreated wood to keep the birds safe for sure. Oh, I thought there was one more after that. Um, so these are some of the recommended resources for nest boxes, as well as just bird information in general. So I mentioned Nest Watch from Cornell. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology is one of my go-to resources for all things birds. So they, you can just literally do a search online for Nest Watch and whatever species, and they will, they have a whole list of plans for cavity nesting species. Audubon, same thing. Um, tons of good information. Sibley, anything Sibley birds is really good. <laughs> Um, and then we have some good information as well through um, what we used to call EDIS. It's now called Ask IFIS um, through the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Resources. Now I have to do a quick plug. If you are intrigued by anything that I said in today's presentation, we will have a nest building workshop on Saturday, February 19th. So not this Saturday, but next at 10.30 a.m. Space is limited um, for COVID reasons as well as supply materials reasons. Um, it is $25 per nest box and it's a make and take. So you actually, we're gonna do a quick um, information session on the Eastern Screech Owl, which is who we're building this nest box for. Um, and then you actually get a hammer and nails and you're gonna put this thing together. It'll look some like what it is in my hand here. And so if you're interested, you can just go to brookercreekpreserve.org. If you scroll down on that main page, there's a link to register from there. And then of course, I have to plug my <laughs> podcast. If you're interested in just learning about all things nature, I do have a podcast that I do in collaboration with Shannon, who I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation. 
It's called Naturally Florida, and we release short 15 to 20 minute episodes once a month. So if you're into podcasts, I encourage you to check it out. We would appreciate your support. Um, you can scan the QR code there or just do a search on your favorite podcasting platform. And I'm going to wrap up with a quick poll. And then I will open up my chat while you guys are doing that and start to answer questions. Okay, and I'll, have, I'll actually wait till <clears throat> the majority of you have answered the poll so you can focus on the Q&A session. Okay, I'll give like 10 more seconds. Looks like most of you have answered. Thank you guys very much for, for answering that. That's just helpful for our reporting purposes and to see how we can improve the content that we provide. All right, perfect. All of you have answered. Thank you. I'm gonna end that. Okay, so now I'm gonna scroll through my chat. So let's see. I have a banyan tree that has a huge dead limb. I have to cut down the tree if I stack a bunch of the wood and my helping animals are inviting termites. <clears throat> so of course there's always the risk anytime there's dead wood for termites to come in. Um, I'd say in general, we always stress that we kind of call that like a brush pile. Um, that is gonna be beneficial for significantly more species than just termites. I mean, so many um, invertebrate species, lizards, snakes, rats, which all those things might scare you, but it's all part of the life cycle and will ultimately again support birds and other local wildlife species. So um, I'd say for sure it would be worth doing. And if you do end up having termites, you know, you can always get rid of it. But, and again, it's going to eventually decompose and go away. Um, the cool part about nature. So let's see what else. Okay. Any issues with getting multiple? non-raptor species nesting in the same yard is one species best? So that's actually a really good question. Um, and I would, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would say it really depends on which species because uh, there's a really cool graphic, I should have included in my presentation that basically shows that Birds, even like within a tree, will occupy different niches, like in terms of where they occupy the tree at the very top, in the middle, down below. So I'd say you'd probably be able to attract a variety of species with a variety of nest boxes, as long as you just space them out and follow their criteria, again, for like how high it should be placed above the ground, um, and if it has preference for directions and things like that. But that's going to be some homework for me. I don't know. Um, if there's an official research-based answer to that, but that would be my educated response. Okay, what can we do if squirrels take over the box? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That is definitely something uh, to consider, something I probably should have mentioned is right. So A, these species are not gonna be using the nest box year round, most of them. They just use it for nesting season. When they're done with that, um, they go out and about and they won't be in the cavities. Occasionally they'll be used for roosting year round, um, but not all of them do that. If squirrels, and then when they're not in use, other species might take advantage like squirrels. There's really not a ton you can do. Um, there are some more preventative things that you can do to keep predators out of the um, nest boxes. There are different guards and things that you can um, put either on the poles or they have um, extensions um, from the hole that can prevent certain species from going in. And there is research that shows that those are effective, not specifically for squirrels though. <laughs> so I would say kind of just let nature take its course and 
hopefully the squirrels will do their business and move on and then they can be, um, you know, hopefully it can be reoccupied by somebody else. Squirrels similarly will not be using the boxes year round. So you could also just wait until they're done, kind of clean it out and hope that next nesting season it will be occupied by your desired species. Okay, it is one o'clock, so um, feel free if you have additional questions, I'm happy to stay on, but I'm gonna kind of do a formal wrap up. Um, so thank you guys again so much for tuning in today to today's webinar on cavity nesters in Florida. Again, if you're interested in doing a, the workshop to build your own nest box for the Eastern Screech Owl, please go ahead and register for that. It's next Saturday, not this coming one, but the following one. Um, and yeah, just follow us on, brookercreekpreserve.org to see what other programs we have coming up and have a good rest of your week.